Ethereum is the world's first decentralized computer built on the blockchain. Its cryptocurrency, Ether, reached a market cap of $100 billion. Wow, that's a lot of money. Ethereum enables so-called decentralized application with built-in support for transferring money. Impossible to censor, impossible to stop. Facebook, Twitter, I'm looking at you. The future of finance, DeFi, or decentralized finance, is being built on Ethereum with already 25 billion invested. And this is just a small part of the full potential of Ethereum. Voting, social media, supply chain, games, the possibilities are endless. Our entire society is going to be impacted by this tech. And who knows, maybe it can make coffee too, I don't know. <laughs> so in this video, I will explain how Ethereum works, including smart contracts and decentralized applications. But not so fast, Ethereum is built on the blockchain technology. If you don't already know how blockchain works, check out this other video on my channel first and come back here after. If you don't know me, I'm Julian and on my channel in the blocks, I teach blockchain development. Before Ethereum was created, we already had another blockchain called Bitcoin. Why do we even bother with Ethereum? Bitcoin works great for simple financial transactions like Bob sends one Bitcoin to Alice, but not for more advanced use case. Side note, if you learn blockchain or crypto stuff, you will notice that everybody always use Bob and Alice in the example. You have to use Bob and Alice. If you use other names, it doesn't work. <laughs> In 2014, a very smart developer called Vitalik Buttering became frustrated with Bitcoin. He started to work on another blockchain more powerful than Bitcoin. He basically wanted to build a computer on top of the blockchain technology. How crazy is that? He called this new blockchain Ethereum. Vitalik first mentioned Ethereum publicly at a Bitcoin conference in Miami in January 2014. His idea had a really good reception. A team of developers joined him to work on the first prototype of Ethereum. They all happily coded for months and months until the big launch in July 2015 when the Ethereum network started. It quickly attracted many entrepreneurs, investors and users who were eager to experiment with this new development platform. Today, the ecosystem of Ethereum is vibrant with hundreds of companies building on it. Lots of users, lots of great crypto YouTubers like me. The influence of Ethereum in the blockchain ecosystem is huge as a lot of other blockchains are pretty much copy paste of the Ethereum technology. The media mostly talk of Bitcoin, but most of the activity in the blockchain industry is on Ethereum. Next, we are going to dive in the technology of Ethereum and we will start with the Ethereum network. The Ethereum blockchain is a network of more than 10,000 computers connected to each other. Each of these computers run the Ethereum software, also called Ethereum client. Anybody can participate in this network by running an Ethereum client. Well, anybody. This is the theory, but actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. I will talk more about that at the end of the video. Moving on. Developers can deploy an application to the Ethereum network. That's what we call the smart contracts. Once you deploy a smart contract, it runs forever. It's impossible to stop it. It's also impossible to change its code, which can be good and bad because if there is a bug, there is no way to fix it. As a user, you can interact with these smart contracts from anywhere in the world. You only need a connection to internet and a wallet. That's it. Next, I will talk about something very important in Ethereum. Ethereum has a built-in cryptocurrency, that's what we call Ether. Just to be clear, it's totally different from Bitcoin. These two cryptocurrencies live on two different blockchains that are totally separated. You can transfer Ether between different people using Ethereum. When you combine Ether with smart contracts, it allows you to create unstoppable applications that can move money. That's really what makes Ethereum so powerful. Contrary to Bitcoin, Ether doesn't have a limited supply. There are more than 110 million Ether currently, and new Ether is created every time a miner adds a new block to Ethereum. Like for Bitcoin, the price of Ether is determined by the market. The Ethereum blockchain doesn't care at all about the price of Ether. It only cares about who owns how many Ether, that's it. Next, I will explain the structure of the Ethereum blockchain. 
On the Ethereum blockchain, you need to understand a fundamental concept called account. There are two kinds of accounts. EOA or external own account, that's the kind of account that is used by humans. The other kind of account is for smart contracts. Each account is associated to several fields, an address field that identify the account, a value field that's the Ether value that is owned by the account, a code field, if this is a smart contract account, this is the code of the smart contract, otherwise it's empty. A data field, if this is a smart contract, that's the data of the smart contract, otherwise it's empty. A nonce field, that's an integer that is incremented after each transaction, that is used to order transactions. So in the Ethereum blockchain, like for Bitcoin, the data is organized by block. In each block, we have a hash of the previous block to keep the integrity of the blockchain. Transactions which represent state changes in the blockchain. For example, a transaction could change the amount of Ether of an EOA account or the data associated to a smart contract. And we have the entire state of Ethereum, which is the collection of accounts and the associated values. There is much more data in the Ethereum blockchain compared to Bitcoin, which is a reflection of the advanced capabilities of Ethereum. Next, I will explain what are smart contracts. Smart contracts are the small programs at the heart of the Ethereum technology. First of all, let's clarify something very important. Smart contracts are not smart and they are not contracts. It's probably the worst name that was chosen. <laughs> Instead, understand that a smart contract is a program. It has some code and it does what the code says and that's it. As I explained in the previous section, smart contracts have an address, a balance of ether, some code and some data. The code specifies how the data can be modified. The code of smart contract is grouped in functions. If you want to modify the data of a smart contract, you need to send a transaction to execute one of these functions. The smart contract can also call the functions of other smart contracts. The main programming language used for Ethereum smart contracts is called Solidity. If you want to learn Solidity, I have a full series on this on my channel. Solidity is a high-level language. The Ethereum blockchain does not understand it. Before a smart contract is deployed to the blockchain, it is compiled to some elementary instruction that Ethereum can understand. The part of Ethereum that deals with smart contract execution is called the Ethereum Virtual Machine. It understands more than 100 elementary instructions, also called EVM opcodes. Next, I will explain wallets and transactions. Wallets are external software. Each user has his own Ethereum wallet. A wallet has a private key, which is like a secret password. The private key is associated to an EOA address. Remember, I mentioned in the previous section that there are two kinds of accounts, EOA and smart contracts. EOA addresses are for humans. When a user wants to interact with Ethereum, he will send a transaction using his wallet. He can send a transaction to another EOA address or to a smart contract. The transaction will contain the following parameters. The from field, that's the sending address. The to field, if the transaction is a simple ether transfer, this is the recipient address. Otherwise, this is the address of the smart contract that is called. The value field, that's the amount of ether that is transferred. The data field, this is only used in transaction to smart contract to specify which function to call with which input data. Gas and gas limit field, when you send a transaction to Ethereum, you need to pay for transaction fees. The more complex your transaction, the higher the transaction fees. These two parameters are used to specify how much transaction fees you are willing to pay. If you are willing to pay more, your transaction can be mined faster. On the other hand, if you don't pay enough, your transaction might not be mined at all. Transaction fee are specified with a unit called gas. Gas is a whole discussion of its own and if you want to know more about that, you can check out my series on Ethereum gas. Then we have the nonce field, it's an integer that is incremented after each transaction. And we have the signature. This is created using the data of the transaction and the private key associated to the from address. This guarantees that the owner of the sending address really wanted to send this transaction. Once the transaction is ready, it's sent to the Ethereum network, picked up by a miner and a mine in the next block. Next, I will talk of decentralized applications. 
The problem with smart contracts is that they are not very easy to use. If you want to interact with them directly, you will need to use a terminal not very user friendly. That's why we build a so-called decentralized applications or DAP. A DAP is a combination of a smart contract plus a front-end interface. In general, the front-end interface is a web or mobile application. The front-end interface will interact with the wallet of the user to get him to confirm transactions. The DAP will also need a connection to an Ethereum client in order to read data from the blockchain and send signed transactions. As a user, using a DAP feels like using a normal web application or mobile application, except that you have to manage a wallet software on top of it. Next, we are going to look at the security in Ethereum. Is Ethereum secure? We heard a lot of hacks in the Ethereum ecosystem. What happened exactly? If there is a bug in the code of a smart contract, it's possible for a hacker to take advantage of this vulnerability and potentially steal all the money in the contract. We estimate that in 2020, there were more than $100 million stolen because of smart contract bugs. As we have more hacks, the industry learns about the code patterns that must be avoided and smart contracts become more and more secure. Another kind of hack has to do with wallets. If a hacker managed to steal the private key of your wallet, he can send a transaction with the correct signature and steal all of your ether. This kind of hack happened for centralized exchanges but also in the wallets of of individuals. This is not a flaw of Ethereum itself, it has more to do with the ecosystem. The best way to avoid this is to always stay in control of your crypto and use hardware wallets like the Nano Ledger. Finally, there is something very important to understand about security. There is no bug in the code of the Ethereum software itself. For example, it's not possible to send a transaction with some special input that will mess with the code of the Ethereum client and put you in control of someone else's money, this is not possible. So this is the most important, and this is why I think Ethereum is very secure. Next, I'm gonna talk of the use case of Ethereum. The most popular use case for Ethereum is DeFi or decentralized finance. So DeFi is all about reinventing finance, but on the blockchain. No more banks, no more intermediaries that take all your money. All of this is replaced by smart contracts. One of the most popular DeFi app is Uniswap, a decentralized exchange that allows you to trade crypto assets on the blockchain without any middleman. Another very popular DeFi project is Compound. With Compound, you can borrow money on the blockchain. Another really cool DeFi project is MakerDAO and it's stablecoin DAI. This is a cryptocurrency that always keep the same value. One DAI always equal one dollar. And DeFi doesn't stop there. There are new projects every single week, new crazy things like Flashdown that allow you to borrow millions of dollars without any collateral. You just snap your finger and you have $1 million. It's like magic. In case you're wondering, you do have to reimburse the money. It's actually not possible technically to not reimburse the money of the flash loan. So DeFi is really the main use case for blockchain. So if you want to get into blockchain, I strongly suggest that you focus on DeFi. Another use case for Ethereum is games. So there is a lot of confusion about blockchain games. A blockchain game, for most of it, is just like a normal game. Most of it is outside of the blockchain. So it could be a mobile app, a desktop app, a web application. There is only a tiny part of the game that we put on the blockchain. That's the economy of the game. For example, in a virtual reality game like Decentraland, players acquire virtual properties. These virtual properties are stored in the Ethereum blockchain. So this way, players can trust that they will keep possession of their virtual assets. They don't need to trust the game developers. I know it sounds so crazy to buy some virtual piece of land on the blockchain, but be aware that some people have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for some virtual properties. It's really nuts, but if they know what they're doing, they can maybe resell it for an even higher price in the future, who knows? Next, I want to talk about the future of Ethereum. Ethereum is not perfect and is still not ready for mainstream adoption. So you will have to wait before you show Ethereum to your grandma. First, the network has a very limited capacity of only 15 transactions per second. This is way too low to have a mainstream adoption. For example, the Visa network processes thousands of transactions per second. 
Next, because of this limited capacity, users have to compete with each other in order to get the transaction mined. This is why it's very expensive to send transactions to the Ethereum network. When a network is congested, it can cost hundreds of dollars for doing certain operations. Not great. Another issue is speed. It takes about 15 seconds to get a transaction mined on Ethereum. It's not a great user experience to click on the button and wait so long before the action is completed. Another issue is centralization. So even though Ethereum uses the blockchain technology, because it takes a lot of resources to be a miner, mining activities are very concentrated around a few mining companies. Ethereum 2.0 is the next version of Ethereum. It will make Ethereum way more scalable with a capacity of 100,000 transactions per second when combined with side chains. It will have a main chain called the Bacon chain. Uh, what I'm saying, <laughs> I was thinking about food. No, no, no. The Bacon chain, which is connected to many separate blockchain called shards. The proof of work consensus algorithm will be changed to another consensus algorithm called proof of stake. In this new consensus, instead of spending electricity to mine new blocks, miners now called validators will have to stake some ether. If they mine a correct block, they will get some reward pending ether. Otherwise, they will lose their ether stake. The big advantage is that it's more eco-friendly and it also requires much less computing resources to be a miner, which means everybody can be a validator, you just need a standard consumer laptop. We estimate that there will be hundreds of thousands of validators in Ethereum 2.0, way more than the 10,000 miners in Ethereum 1. If you are interested in Ethereum 2.0, I have a video to show you how you can set up a validator node and make some passive income by staking Ether. If you want to dive deeper in the blockchain technology, I have another video to explain how blockchain works and a whole playlist on the blockchain technology. I'll see you there.